three, two, one, and I think we're live. Welcome to episode number four of Campfire Cowork's Fireside Chats with Firestarters, which is our bi-weekly series in which we talk with entrepreneurs, social impact leaders, visionaries, dreamers of a better world, um, about the things that they're doing to build that better world. Before we get started, a little shout out, our traditional shout out to Bang Energy Drink. Fuel your destiny with Bang. We are, uh, in fact, a sponsor. Uh, we believe we're a sponsor anyway, because we drink enough Bang around here to fuel our destiny. And that's exactly what we're here doing. I'm here this week with our guest, uh, James Wallington, uh, web developer, engineer, deep thinker, possibly a descendant of Druids. We'll get into that a little bit as well. And founder of Wallington Web. Welcome to the show, Mr. Wallington. Thanks. James. Glad to be here. Excited for our talk. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you've been a regular here around the campfire for a while now, and uh, you've quickly become a genuinely valued member of the team. We're stoked and grateful that you're here. Uh, but you're not from the Marquette area, so why don't we start with a little bit of you know who you are, what's your background, and what brought you to the UP? Yeah, so I grew up downstate Michigan. Um, got into development jobs about five years ago. Started going wherever I could get the work. Um, eventually found a company that was based out of Detroit and another agency that has a location in New York City uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, wandered out there for a while, developed my skills. Um, my daughter is up here. So once COVID hit, there was kind of the, the hint in the air that everything might be fully remote. Or, you know, you can start remote here, but it's not really solidified. Um, and then I kind of got the go ahead. So I jumped up here to Marquette about a month and a half ago, never been here prior in my life. Um, and so here I am, you know, excited. There's interesting people. You guys are great so far. Um, yeah. And that's, that's kind of how I wound up here uh, out of nowhere on a whim. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it's a beautiful place. You know, I'm loving it more and more as, as I'm here. Uh, yeah, I'm especially excited to see the, the snow officially clear up. We're almost there. Yeah. See what it has to offer. <laughs> you're not a snow guy? No, I, I mean, I am, but... Because you're going to need to get used I, to the snow. I, I've gotten a couple hints of, like, the magic of summer up here, and it just... I'm, I'm intrigued by it. it. It seems like it's going to be quite the place. Yeah, you're in for a treat. It really is a magical place in the summer, and, and frankly, the spring, the late fall. I mean, there's there's just... All year round, you'll, you'll find that there's something to love around here. Um, so before COVID, then it sounds like you were you were there was still that sense that even though you're a developer, even though technically you can do your work anywhere, um, mm -hmm. there was still an expectation to check in or to be in certain places. Is that, is that yeah? The case? Yeah, it wasn't especially for the company that I'm working at. Um, it, it wasn't an exact expectation. Like there's no clear like, hey, you need to be here at this time. But there was the the chance that say a meeting comes up where you know they needed me in person and they just weren't really to they weren't willing to let that go officially mm -hmm. until they really structured guidelines about you know how are we going to support our business with a full remote staff. Yeah. The benefit for me is my company we have employees all in the United States as it is, so that infrastructure was kind of there, and, and we we did move quicker than some of these other companies that are just now rolling around. Google, Facebook, like offering people, you can you can work remote full time forever. Yeah. yeah, you know your contract can be restructured so you can be remote, and there's no expectation for you to come back in. Um, but again, I was lucky because my company kind of had that process in place, and it was kind of we were all under the impression that it was going to happen, um, and then like my company officially announced it, and you know I've been working remote ever since. It's I was I was working remote about two days a week. Um, as it was like pre-COVID. So I had the whole setup at home. I, I understood, you know, how to balance things yeah. uh, in that way. I think that's a big part of it. Companies, you know, fearing prior to COVID, fearing that, well, you know, will, will we really be able to manage employees' time? Will employees feel engaged? Will they, you know, stay with us? Uh, and, and, you know, in fact, I had the opposite, uh, maybe the opposite situation a few years ago when I was thinking about leaving. Um, and I was thinking about moving to the Bay Area because I had a potential opportunity with AWS. And, but AWS's rule at the time was you have to be in the Bay Area. Uh, and so I turned it down because I was just, there was no way I was gonna move a family of five to the Bay Area. 
uh, you know, I, I would, they would have to pay me a million dollars and I'd still not be able to afford to live there. Yeah, it's an interesting turn with a lot of these bigger companies because on one hand, they're offering all their, you know, Silicon Valley employees, you can go fully remote. And that's, that's a great thing for the people living there. Um, but it's also kind of a double-edged sword in a way because you're not just competing with people in Silicon Valley anymore. You're competing with people globally for yeah. that job. Yeah. So, so there is the kind of worry where the ease to get one of those big tech jobs now is slowly becoming harder and harder and harder because mm -hmm. now with a fully remote system built around them, everyone can apply for that job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's a good. That's a good point. Well, you're definitely one of the. I mean, here in Marquette, one of the senses is that hey, this is a big change for Marquette and for the possibilities because a lot of people have wanted to move to Marquette, maybe wanted to return to Marquette, but haven't been able to because of the, you know, where what would they do? Um, and now there's kind of an excitement in the air about what this could all mean for Marquette and other small towns around the country which could be also a double-edged sword because, you know, how quickly is that going to happen? How quickly is growth going to happen? What's it going to do to our infrastructure? But uh, you're certainly a, a walking, talking example of what the economic developers are sort of going, hey, this is great over, right? Because here you are. Uh, and so we're, we're glad to have you here. Um, as a developer, let's switch gears a little bit about your background and, and how you got into computers to begin with, development. I mean, was this something that was a a, a, an avocation or how when did you get started yeah i think i mean i had an affinity towards development in general um since i was about five years old um it was always just something that was there that was like a hobby for me i enjoyed it but you just kind of how my family worked was you know go be a doctor go major in chemistry you know be be rich successful healthcare worker so the, the idea of it as a career was never really in my head for whatever reason, but I, I knew I loved it. It just never clicked for me that I can make a career out of this and, and do something I really enjoy. Mm. So I kind of messed around and went to college for lab sciences, chemistry, and got to the point where somebody asked me to do some development for them for money while I was in college, you know, making no money. So at that point, like I did the project and it was, you know, good money for compared to what I was making in college and realized uh, there's actually a career opportunity in this field. Um, and then kind of from that point, I never really looked back. Hmm. Uh, so did you actually switch a major and get a computer science no. degree? No. Okay. So, and then how did you pursue your development skills from that point at which you're like, okay, I'm going to pivot out of that track and into development. So. My brother-in-law like randomly suggested like coding boot camps to me like seven years ago, I think eight years ago. And I, and I kind of dabbled in those. I never really wanted to fully commit and like do one of the programs because a lot of them are structured is it's kind of like a profit sharing model. So you can either take the course for free and they'll get you hired for 50,000, 60,000 or more. And they'll yeah. take 20% of your salary for two years. Yeah. That, I didn't like. And the second option was just pay $20,000 for a year. Also did not like that. <laughs> so I, I just had been digging into resources, people who've done this, watching YouTubers talk about their experiences with like how to learn coding, how they got into it. And really the general consensus for the people that seemed trustworthy to me was just do it yourself. There's resources that are free um, and kind of the biggest most beneficial part for me a piece of advice that they gave was these tutorials and stuff you can go through you know list by list follow a guy who's coding a web application and, and do what he's doing build the exact thing he's building and, and a lot of that is good for foundational skills but what a lot of these youtubers and other you know coding icons would say is like pick a problem in your life that you could make more efficient, you can solve with a program and just build it for yourself mm -hmm. and dig into it. You'll run into walls all over the place and you'll have to figure, you, you know, dig yourself out of that hole. And by going through that experience, you're act, you know, you're developing real practical skills. Mm -hmm. So I basically just picked, you know, I played a lot of video games at the time and I picked 
I picked like an API for the video game I played with and figured out how to make a program that would give me like builds and, and things about characters, you know, something that was re relatable to me and that I could use. And I just tried building it. Yeah. And it took forever and ever and ever. But by going through that process, I really learned kind of how the development structure actually works because most of the time, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Yeah. And, and a lot of people assume developers just sit on the computer and they type away and they whip stuff up out of nowhere. But it's really just searching for knowledge. Like you're constantly running into a dead end and you have to figure out from what you, you know in the past, you know, how to navigate that dead end and make it work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the, the beauty of development is it's, it's a constant challenge and puzzle into how do you get past this and propel your project forward? Um, and, and you learn, you know, how to be resourceful, how to utilize Google, how to how to find the right resources that'll that'll help you with this project. Mm. And and that's you know, as a beginner, that that world of knowledge is just so huge. And as you get better and better, it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks till you have your go-to resources where you want to find stuff out, you know it works, it's tried and true, and it works for, for you. And you probably find your niche along the way too, because it is so big, nobody's ever going to know it all. Right. And you, you'll find what is attracting you to, you know, a, a given language or a given problem set or a given, you know, architecture or whatever, right? Whatever calls to you, and then you start to get better and better in that area. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting metaphor for, for life, really, in the modern era to me, because you know, we're constantly, no matter whether we're a coder or, uh, you know, a business person or whatever field you may be in, technology is changing so quickly. You know, even if you're, even if you're retired, right? Trying to figure out how to pay your bills changes from week to week right. these days. So becoming comfortable with just figuring shit out, pardon my French, uh, you know, is, is part of the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would imagine that, um, you know, in, in a classroom setting, sometimes the problem can be you go to a go to a university setting, for example, and by the time you're done with a class, that technology has already changed. Whereas if you're out there actually doing it, applying it, you're changing with it. Yeah, is that is that accurate? Yeah, yeah that's definitely my understanding. And you know, I I, I want to go back for a computer science degree at some point, and I think like those degrees do a really good job of like bird's eye view mm -hmm. of, of software architecture. Whereas like there's there's no way you can just teach how to build an application because they're so different every time. The things you're doing are different every time. The way it's communicating with different databases and different languages is gonna be different every time. So you can't really make a course about that. And that's going back to like these online courses where you watch a guy build something. Yeah. Like it, it's not, it's helpful, but you can't like replicate it to, to build something slightly different. You yeah. need to understand what you're doing. And I think these software degrees do a really good job of helping those new developers who are jumping in with a CS degree versus someone who's not. They, they have an understanding of how they should approach the problem a bit faster than mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going a little further back in your history, then you mentioned from the age of five. So you must have had some exposure to computers in your life if you were. So what was that like? Did you go to school where there was um, available equipment and stuff in school? Was it in your in your, in your family yeah. life? Or? Yeah, I mean, well, it all kind of stems to my mom. She's like a huge tech geek, always buying robots and, you know, on the forefront of computers back in the day. So mm -hmm. we always had some kind of computer to tweak around and mess around with. My my parents would, when we'd get in trouble growing up, they'd take away our router, <laughs> they'd unplug it. So I'd have to figure a way to like, get on the internet without a router and stuff. <laughs> so, so a lot of that was, it was just like the natural curiosity and the funness of, you know, how can I figure out how to change this thing? Um, but my high school, we, all, we had web development classes, so mm -hmm. I took, I took web development for four years in high school and we had the final class was webmasters and that's you basically manage the school's website and their it system um, and there there were tons of brilliant students at, at my high school which is oxford high school um in the whole computer science realm mm -hmm. and we had you know a media library a really thought out I mean, one of the best in the state robotics programs so i was definitely exposed and had the resources to you know, learn about this type of thing, which mm -hmm. which I was spoiled in that sense because 
you know, there's kids still today, and you know, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. Kids still today who don't have a computer lab or even anything close to a web development course. That's right, an awful lot of them. And that's one of the things we've evangelized pretty well in Marquette, but you get outside of the Marquette boundaries and you know, throughout the Upper Peninsula and throughout rural America, that's a huge challenge, you know, just access to this type of resource and to the, not only the resource, but you can give the resource to educators who then don't know how to use it because they've never been given the empowerment. That's changing, but, uh, but you know, it's one of those things where we really have to pay attention to how can we, um, you know, it's the, everything is so dependent on technology these days that to function in society without being used by technology almost requires that you have a fundamental understanding of computer science so that you, even if you're never going to touch a, a keyboard, you know, and, and do a line of code yourself, um, you're going to influence policy. You're going to make decisions in your life. You're going to be engaging with technology. So it's it's an area that's really a conundrum, I think, for, for a lot of areas uh, in, the, in the country. Um, so flashing forward to now, right? It, I think every day, like we said, technology changes. It's, how do you go about staying sharp and learning new things where now you're also having to earn a living uh, and you work for a company. You've got your own company on the side like a lot of people in the world today. Um, how, do you, how do you juggle all those balls and stay on top of new technology? Um, <clears throat> Twitter for one of like really prophetic, awesome programmers, guys who are you know, because we're kind of on the shoulders of giants in a lot of ways. And there's there's a handful of people who are building this industry and propelling it forward, just like the guys who invented the computer. Um, so just like seeing what those people think and, and seeing what they're building and, and how they're doing things and, and how they're thinking about software for the next 15 years, um, you know, is a really good resource to, to see somebody who's, you know, an expert because nobody knows everything about computer science and, and there's and, and there's people who are pretty damn close to knowing everything about computer science and i think those kind of guys are the sort of pioneers of today and a lot of people look towards them and say you know what framework are we using now yeah and then everybody jumps on it develops it the open source model kicks off for all these changes and restructuring of it and we see how far we can take it um and you see that with like with with react or angular a lot some of these other frameworks where someone big like Facebook develops it and puts it out into the open and says, you know, this has a good core and foundation and I think it can go somewhere cool. Mm -hmm. And and all the open source developers and people use it and rip it apart to, to see what they can make it. Um, but I mean, going back to your question, I think it's just important to, you know, find a, a role model in the computer science industry and in the programming industry and, and watch what they're doing and, and, and see what they're working on and try and understand, you know, why, why are they choosing this framework over another? And, and what does it mean, you know, from a 10 year scope? Mm -hmm. um, so I think like to stay up to date for me, at least, like I have a handful of people that I like to, you know, I, I believe their vision of the future is, is what's gonna roll out. And, and that's kind of how I keep up with you know what's going on what's yeah that's on. that's a good point and i think it's applicable to all of us i mean i'm not a coder by any stretch but um what you're saying is something that i i do also i follow people like lex friedman for example who's a, he's got an ai podcast and he has some really incredible minds on that podcast sometimes and they talk about things that are well beyond my my current scope of understanding but that's how i learn about where is the industry going and about the big things like you know they had it the other day they were talking with a guest about the notion that at Google there are very few very few people if anyone at Google who can really explain how Google works like there's no right. one person that can really under, understand or articulate all of the pieces it's it's this it's become its own entity and so much of technology today is like that i think that's a, also a unique problem for google and like the biggest Google is, is they're they're like dreamers, I guess, of the software industry where they just do crazy shit and they try it. If it doesn't work, they throw it away. Yeah. And a lot of these other companies, you know, when they start a project, they intend to finish it and keep it alive as long as possible. The, the problem with Google is they have so much complexity to manage that they're just this freight train that's heading off with millions of lines of code that is completely unmanageable and they have real no direction on how to 
how to deal with it. Yeah. Um, but like, and that's why nobody can understand what Google is in its entirety because <laughs> it's it's humanly impossible unless some AI model can can come in and you know start cleaning it up. It's and even there, you get into a problem that nobody knows what the AI is doing, you know, right. and and how do you untangle that web? And we're, I mean, as a as a species, we're very very close to that that horizon where uh, we will no longer be able to understand how technology is doing what it's doing. We'll be able to interact with it, we'll be able to interpret it, we'll be able to influence it, but we will be at a point at which we may not be able to keep up until there's actually a human te you know, technology interface that is more direct, uh, and that's coming as well. Yeah, I've, I've listened to a couple podcasts where they talk about how, like our predictions for how AI does things are always way off mm -hmm. because the way that AI thinks, and one of the examples this lady gave was th they programmed an AI to cross a, a bridge, right? And they need to get from point A to point B. And, and the human, you know, would assume that they'd make the model walk with legs really fast in the most efficient way. And she played the video of the AI, you know, solving this problem, and it literally just fell over from point A to point B. <laughs> it, it achieved what it what it was supposed to do, but... How, it didn't have the human-centric limitations right. in its assumption set. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so and, and that's a lot of the problem that I understand with AI right now is if AI is doing these kind of kinds of things to solve problems and we can't really predict it or control it, you know, when does it become dangerous? Yeah. Yeah, and that's that is a really huge question, and I wonder if you, as a developer, have thoughts on, you know, when we look at at the state of artificial intelligence, even though it's very much in its infancy today and where we really are, but we look at the state of, of artificial intelligence and cloud computing and things like the edge technologies that will come along with five G and the way in which devices are proliferating, everything's being connected, um, and you, then you think about what's happening in neuroscience and you know, implanted compute devices. Uh, in fact, just this week we were listening to a, a, a talk about an experiment where they had mapped uh, the instructions in a, in, a, in a brain of a, a rat that had learned its way through a maze to get food, right? And then they were able to connect that brain and that rat to another rat in another state over the internet. And instantaneously that other rat knew how to navigate that maze and get that. So you can see that we're rapidly approaching this state where um, hackers may be able to hack us, you know, where we may be able to like lose our, our, our the essence of who we are. So you're you're a father, you have a little girl. Uh, you know, does anything scare you about where we're going as a developer, uh, and what excites you about that? I mean, the future is going to be really weird. It's going to be so weird, especially with AI and, and these automated processes that have been, that are handling things that they've never done before. And, we, and again, going back to, we don't really know how they're going to do it yeah. either. So it's definitely going to be weird. It's scary in a sense because we we don't know the consequences of it. Um, but the, I mean, the way I see it is, it's kind of part of the human evolution process. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we will merge with machinery. Yeah. And I and I think that's why, like, with Neuralink and a lot of these other BCI brain computer interface companies are trying to solve this problem is because that that ex exponential growth of AI is gonna happen inevitably soon. And, it, and we need to find a way to merge with it so that it's it's kind of like a layer on, on top of our brain that's a, a technology layer. And, I, and I've heard like Elon Musk gave the example that, you know, we're already kind of part cyborg with our phones. You know, we're already, we have this digital layer already. Um, so we need to figure out how to integrate integrate with it so it just doesn't do its own thing. Yeah, no, I and mean, we're in this weird phase right now of all that where we're sort of like a cyborg, but our interface is so woefully inefficient, you know, mm -hmm. that we're trying to keep up with multiple, you know, there's a, there's Slack and there's email and there's all these things we're jumping around. Our fingers can only move so quickly. Right. Our digits can't keep up with the digits that are being transmitted and, and we in order to effectively keep up with what we're creating, it's going to have to, like you said, we're going to have to merge with technology um, because our brain is, compat is capable of, of keeping up with those transactions. But um, boy, it does open a really scary 
potentially scary can of worms. Exciting also, uh, because you know the idea that um, empathy can be taken to a whole new level if I can actually feel the pain that you're going through, right? Mm -hmm. It can be taken to a hellish new level, but it, it can also be taken to a new level in terms of human discourse, you know, and human understanding of one another's experience. So I think there's going to be um, some really tremendous pro possibilities that come along with it. But uh, one of the things I, I'm curious as a developer uh, and a father of a daughter, like when I have the opportunity to talk to middle school age kids, including my own daughters, I always encourage girls in particular to think about and go into computer science or at least be thinking about computer science from a philosophical standpoint. Um, and the reason for that is that I think we are, I know that we are rebuilding the, our, our world as human beings again. There was the industrial Re revolution and the agricultural revolution, the information era, and now we're going into this weird human, human computer, you know, evolution, cyborgian place. And it's being driven almost exclusively by men. Um, and when we think about the philosophical aspects and the, you know, what, it, it, it worries me a little bit. And I say to young women, you know, do you want to live in that world again that's been reinvented primarily by men? Uh, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that in terms of uh, it, either as a father or as a developer. Yeah, I mean, I, I've worked with so many great women engineers, my company's women owned. It definitely is an industry that is, you know, predominantly male. And, and, and there is sexism involved in it. Um, but I think that that is a dying thought process in the world today. So I think like 10 years from now, you know, I, I don't think this is, will even be a practical question to really ask. And maybe that's a little bit optimistic thinking because I do have a daughter and I think she's the smartest person in the world. Yeah. But I, I think those those doors are opening to women as time goes on. And there's thousands of women who can fill those roles. Yeah. So the more that happens, the more they'll be integrated into the entire culture of it. Um, and, and it eventually will just be exponential where, you know, if you're a woman engineer, is there's no problem. Yeah. No, I, I don't worry about that. I tend to agree with you. And, and I mean, in the optimism department, and we can see that that arc is happening. Um, I do see this, this strange thing that happens. Um, I think it's more societal, but I, you know, when, it, when I was doing coding with, with youth, um, for six years, I helped to run a, a, a coding club for kids here. And we used, um, methods that applied to ages five to 18 and from five to about 13 or 14, there was this pretty even mix of boys and girls that showed up. And after about 13, it became almost exclusively boys that would show up. And it wasn't that the girls didn't like it. They really enjoyed engaging with technology. They were very good at it. Um, the thought process of children, of girls when they're coding is a lot more, in my view anyway, it was a lot more elegant and considered in terms of the efficiency that they put into their solutions. And boys are just kind of renegade bang, you know, charging away into things. And uh, But I think something societal happens at that age uh, where it's no longer cool for them and it's no longer, um, something that there is encouraged into and I, I think that is changing i hope you're right uh, i'm going to be an optimist with you on that uh, because i actually don't want to live in a world that's where we're going right if, we're, if the world is completely reinvented by males uh, I, I don't think i want to be a part of it either <laughs> no i just, i don't think it's even a possibility yeah no that's a that's a very good uh outlook and i I, uh, I'm going to go with you on that. So let's shift a little bit about um, out of the technical and into the more entrepreneurship side of things for a little bit, because, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, in our state, in our country, in the world about the importance of um, entrepreneurship, innovation, and sort of decentralization of ideas. Um, and we're seeing a, a trend toward that, that I think COVID is going to accelerate. And you're obviously an entrepreneur because you've got Wallington Webb. Uh, and you want to talk a little bit about where that came from and what your thoughts are on entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, so the whole reason I want to do my own business, start my own thing really comes down to personal freedom. Um, you know, I've worked for companies with the intention to learn from them, 
you know, you have to start somewhere. Some people have the ability to start from scratch and just do their own thing from the start. Um, I never really was that way, especially with like talking and social interactions and, and doing a, like interviews like this. Um, that's that's a skill I needed to develop, and I knew that I needed to be in a professional workspace to develop it. Mm. Um, so I think there's there's tons of value in the places that I've worked, but ultimately, you know, it's my dad is a business owner, and and just seeing the kind of freedoms that he had to take my family on a vacation when he felt like it, take this day off when he needed to, without you know the stress of I might lose my job yeah. because I need to tend to my family. Um, I think it, it really comes down to that for me and like being able to make my you know own decisions what i believe is is best for myself and my business um without somebody you know threatening my job yeah. be, because of it yeah i could definitely relate to that on on both sides of that equation and you know on the one it was uh i, I learned a lot in the corporate world and probably i hung on in the corporate world longer than i wish i had uh, in many ways but i had a lot of really good experiences and developed a lot of tools personal tools and and, uh, and skills that I think will serve me really well in entrepreneurship. Um, you're jumping into it kind of a, a way ahead of me, uh, and a, so I think you're going to do great with it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Wellington Web and the types of customers you serve and what, what you're doing with that today? Yeah, so as of right now, we're kind of a full service digital agency, so I'll mainly focus on doing websites, web applications, or apps, um, and try and take a company who's in its infancy or is having stale growth and help them implement a digital strategy that'll, you know, help them get out to more users uh, and in return, you know, have those users have a nice experience and navigate to do what they're there to do, you know, as, as efficiently as possible. Because uh, we all know the frustration of this this great company in your city and you go to their website or you go to use any of their tools and it's just not built in for a modern cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's a, a lot of companies that are really being held back by their usability, by their digital platforms. Um, and, and, and at the core of my, my company is, is that's what I wanna help people kind of develop. I have this whole other side of things with like cloud architecture and hosting, which I, which eventually I kind of want to move more into that. And that's mm -hmm. more of a, you know, say you're a developer and you're building something for your company, um, but you don't have the architecture to build on, or you have it and it's super expensive because the, the old way of doing it in an old company I used to work for, you know, they had their servers on premise and they're running 24 hours a day. And if something breaks, all of their projects go down. Yeah. Um, where the world is kind of heading today is, you know, cloud-based and serverless. So by serverless, what I mean is, it, it's kind of like you fill up the gas tank in your car, and when your car is parked and turned off, it's not using any of the gas. With serverless, it's kind of the same thing for a website or an application. When somebody's not utilizing it, you're not paying those gas fees. That you would be to run a server 24 hours a day mm -hmm. um, and along with that kind of architecture comes you know all sorts of data protection you know there's two different versions of your servers um, always living you know if, if one's down and broken the other can you know serve your clients um, and it's the, the uptime the speed the cost efficiency is just unrivaled it, it's not even close to doing it yourself and, and the whole world is slowly moving in that direction. Yeah, and when you put that that notion or those concepts together with what we were talking a little bit ago about, and, and you know, it, for the non-technical small business owner, all of this can seem like it doesn't apply to them. But I, I would submit that it does, you know, especially in places like here in Marquette, where we've seen small businesses hit pretty hard by COVID and where we have a, an economy that is largely based on people coming here versus maybe reaching out to broader markets. Well, when we start to think about, um, you know, the ability to say, well, geez, I'd, I'd like some chocolate uh, and not have to pick up a phone and, and, and go through a cumbersome interface to order it, but just think I'd like some chocolate from Donkers and I want the little 
you know, square cream, you know, cream filled things that I like to get normally and automatically someone at Donkers goes, all right, well, we'll just have that ready for you in 10 minutes because it just thought over there in order. That's where we're headed, right? And right. yes, that's a long way off. But if we reel it in a little bit and we say, you know, what can we do today for a Donkers or a Scandinavian Gifts or a, a restaurant here in Marquette that takes advantage of this serverless technology of mobile applications of websites that isn't going to break the bank but helps them begin to move into that world well, what do you think about the applicability of all this to smaller businesses i mean it's it's super realistic um and I, i've heard jasmine say this a million times you need to think about it like an employee for your company like if you can pay somebody every month to come in and work, you can pay a website to serve your business and your customers every every second of every day. Yeah. Um, and it's, again, with COVID and the way the world is moving forward, is it's not so much a luxury as much as, as it is an essential now. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you don't have that kind of digital layer and it is not thought out and clean and easy to use, you are, costing yourself so much money that that you don't even know exists you yeah. and, and also potentially you mentioned a, a, a term a little while ago data protection uh, in that realm regardless of whether you're a huge enterprise or a small business uh, we've talked about this on some of our other podcasts as well where data protection can become a liability that you don't even know about because if your payment processing or if your website is uh, not secure is compromised and you compromise someone else's data that can actually become a financial liability now because of things like gdpr and california-based uh, privacy rules and we're going to see privacy rules and consumer protection rules uh, and presumably as we go more and more into biometric things in the world you know those those types of regulations are going to impact everybody your business model is you need to be thinking about your digital business model as, as a small business just as well as a, a large business this would be a good time to explore the notion that you might be a uh, descendant of the druids in some way and, and i'll explain that a little bit but um i know that here in michigan over the past decades we've had some interesting discoveries one of which was in lake michigan there is a, a hinge that was found about uh, 120 feet down that was some evidence of, of uh, a similar kind of thing that was going on in Stonehenge over in England from 10,000 years ago. Over on the other side of the state in, in Lake Huron, they found another thing, like a ridge that was extending throughout the, the, uh, the lake that it looked like they'd had some placement of rocks that might be from an ancient settlement. And sort of right in between those two things, there's this other hench that was discovered. Uh, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. The Wally, the Wallington Hinge, the Wally Wallington Hinge, the Wallington Circle. I'm not sure what we call it, but you're, tell us a little bit about your grandfather, Wally Wallington, and what he has done uh, in, in Lower Michigan. Yeah, so my grandpa, first of all, smartest man I've ever met in my life. He's, he's kind of like the biggest figure in my family, the center of everything. The guy's a genius, always has things to teach you. But he he um, grew up uh, poor, was a construction worker his whole life, really talented guy. You know, he told me a funny story about himself once. He said he used to go to, you know, his construction jobs and he'd, he'd always w wear a full suit and tie when, he, <laughs> when he'd go out and work. And he said he'd, he'd go home and he'd tell my grandma, you know, he got back from the office that day. <laughs> but. <laughs> But anyway, his whole life, he was just a construction guy. And for whatever reason, I never really asked him why this came to his mind, but he was watching some kind of documentary or something about how the Stonehenge was built. And he had an idea of how to just do it himself, you know, with his hands, because mm -hmm. there was kind of a lot of debate at the time that aliens either came down and built them for us, or there's no real way that we could physically do it. And with basically sticks and stones, my, my grandfather you know, reproduced it. Yeah. Um, so growing up with him there, uh, he kind of caught wind at one point. It was probably eight, nine, ten years ago. And the Discovery Channel was super interested in the History Channel. Sci-Fi Network came out. All these different TV stations just wanted to get an interview with my grandpa. Yeah. Um, I and I imagine as a kid, because right, you were, how old were you at that time? 
Uh, probably eight, eight years old. Eight years old, I think. And actually, I, you know, I was shocked when you told me that uh, that Wally Wallington was your grandfather because I remembered seeing that documentary. There's like a six minute clip on the internet that I think was done by a Canadian TV station. Uh, mm -hmm. And I had remembered seeing that and I was just blown away. Here was Wally Wallington's descendant, you know, like this is amazing. But as an eight year old kid watching your grandfather moving these stones around that are, uh, if, watch the documentary that's big, Google Wally Wallington. These things are, they weigh as much as a bulldozer, right? And he's just pushing them around by himself using lever principles, uh, that using uh, little rocks as ball bearings and, and using very, very primitive tooling. Uh, to demonstrate that, yeah, one guy could actually build, did build, a Stonehenge. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, growing up with him as a grandfather, it was just inspirational and cool and, you know, something to share with, with your friends. Hey, my grandpa did this, and, you know, and m most people know about that or have seen it in some way from Reddit or YouTube or the news. Um, but it was just really inspirational to have, you know, that kind of figure as my my grandpa you know he was always innovating with things you know of course stonehenge is not the only smart thing the guy's ever done like that's just how he lives his life like when there's a problem he will come up with his own solution whether it be like his automated gardening system in his backyard or you know how how is he gonna fix a, a truck today mm -hmm. um, he just was constantly innovating and developing his own systems with without any textbook, without anybody telling him what to do. I'm not sure he even graduated high school, but just seeing him really like take the initiative to, you know, believe in himself for, for how to how to solve these problems was was a, a very inspirational thing. And you can see it in, in all of his kids as well. My, my dad's the same way, like they don't they don't really go to anybody first they try it themselves try to figure it out themselves and if they need the help they need the help yeah but but there's always that that gut confidence within my family that i i think is really started with my grandpa that's awesome and there's a huge i think a huge lesson in that for all of us and and it can it even start in you know in how we educate children uh, you know the uh, the notion of go ahead and try to figure it out you know, mm -hmm. fail. Uh, tr don't go and immediately ask for a solution, but give it a shot and see what you learn along the way is something that in some ways we've lost as a culture, as a society, and we need to get back to. And that's part of this whole, um, I think, entrepreneurship, innovation, hacking will save the world mentality that, you know, if we start thinking more like Wally Wallington and applying some simple ancient wisdom to our big hairy problems, whether those be you know, moving around big, heavy objects, or how do we build an AI environment that isn't going to kill us? You know, maybe there's maybe maybe there's something in it uh, that that we can take from that. And so I hope you'll let uh, your granddad know that he's certainly inspired me, and he's inspired a lot of people around the world, I'm sure. And uh, you know, it, it, that endeavor is fantastic. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit to the tech side of things, uh, and. Uh, and around uh, your business itself, uh, what? How can somebody learn more about Wallington Web? And uh, I know that you were you're into web development, hosting. It looks like you're going to do some things on the horizon with uh, LMS systems or learning management systems. So, if somebody wants to learn more or engage you, how does how do they go about that? Uh, WallingtonWeb.com. You can email me and give me a phone call. My number's right on the site. Um, and that's kind of how we we would start in the process and understand what you're trying to do. Am I actually able to help you? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's kind of the the starting stage that I'm working on with you know Jasmine and Mike here at, at Campfire is they're really helping me learn how to navigate the beginning of a, a client relationship because what a lot of these companies will do and what I want to do different is I don't want to come into a client relationship with the notion that I'm gonna sell you a website so I can make X amount of money and you know call it good. Mm. Um, where the real benefit for a web agency like me and with a consumer is I can find out a custom solution that you actually need and we can help develop that into real growth. Mm. Because I, I believe at a certain point, when you build a website and you do some simple marketing for people, you're, you hit a ceiling where 
you, you've had success, you've done good growth, but there's there's a ceiling, this cap that is really preventing you from taking your business to a completely different level, a national mm-hmm. level. Yeah. Um, and I think that starts at the foundation of the relationship. So if you go into the relationship knowing that, you know, maybe me build, rebuilding your website isn't the thing you need. Um, maybe there's this other thing that, that, that we can solve uh, that will help your business in a greater extent. And again, going back to Jasmine and Mike, we've been looking into things like tracking metrics from the start, or do you have metrics that we can look at to help you kind of discover, you know, what's what's holding your company back right now? Um, and, it, and it all really comes down to modeling the data out, you know, seeing the actual results, seeing the actual numbers to, you know, predict how, how we can make this grow or predict where you'll be at in a year. And I, I think maybe what I'm hearing you say, you know, embedded in your statement there is is really starting from what are the problems, you know, back to how you started coding. Solve a problem for yourself to, you know, it, it's really identifying what are those fundamental challenges that you're having, whether it's, hey, you need a website because you're not reaching markets or you have a website and you're getting no traffic or, you know, gee, maybe your accounting system is really poor and you don't have a good workflow put together for how you're managing the business on the back end. A lot of different ways that you could start, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to your digital strategy. And it sounds like you're you're suggesting that you'd like to approach clients with with that kind of a hey, let's talk about your digital strategy. Then, if you need a website, great, we can plug that into the architecture of the solution that we want to bring you. Right. right, accurate. Right. Yeah. So I think the run of the mill agency that you know they started popping up ten years ago, and everybody needed a website they were really driven without data. It was just sales. Sell a website for X amount of money because mm-hmm. we need that income. That that model is quickly becoming outdated because there's people who are crunching numbers, are doing analytics, are doing these marketing strategies that will just dominate you and eat you alive. Yeah. Um, and if you want to stay competitive today, like that's where the world is moving. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that's, I mean, I'll, I'll diverge into a little bit of another commercial for Campfire Coworks because we're also trying to tell our story a little bit. And, you know, what we would like to be in part is not only a place where people like you can come and find community, find a jumping off point for your business venture, um, connect with others that are already in, in flight with their businesses, but also a brokerage almost where we can say, well, hey, you know, if somebody in the community is looking for a digital strategy, we don't have to necessarily do it for you, but we can be that place or that portal that can help guide you to the right resources. We can be the facilitator of the process. And in so doing, we create this community where people like James can get together with people like Jasmine or people like James and James on the other side of the country can collaborate together on a client need, um, which with, with a lot less friction and maybe with a more distributed business model that benefits more people. So that's it's just a little bit of a, uh, a campfire commercial, and I will just. It looks like we have a question here from the audience. Um, dream project? Do you have a dream project you'd like to work on? Um, yeah, I have lots of them, but I, I think one of the most interesting problems to work on right now is human language modeling. So, like real-time translation or you're taking a language that somebody's speaking and translating it in somebody's earpiece and there's a lot of people who are working on that problem right now and i think it will it, it's going to change the world in a lot of crazy ways because you some imagine you go to china and you can speak fluidly mm. to somebody without any issues um the babble fish right in that, right. yeah yeah I, I think like working on and developing something like that would be you know just fascinating for me um yeah, I'm all into drone technology, automated agriculture. I think that would be, you know, one of one of my dreams. Have a little farm that is completely self-sufficient and just ran by robots. Yeah, and in, in perfect, you know, a complete, clean distribution of all my water, all my pesticides, just everything. You know, I'm getting it's completely efficient, um, and, and that's a whole nother topic and, and something I, I follow up on a lot is you know, where is agriculture going to go? And I think it's going to be innovated heavily by, you know, technology. And and I I see that as a real potential industry to really 
you know, make a name or find a place in because there's all these other industries that are kind of dominated by big name players. Um, and, and nobody really seems to be talking about the agricultural side of things quite yet. Yeah. And the technology exists and there's people innovating in the space. But realistically, if I wanted to go start a robot farm over here, like there really wouldn't be a very solid solution to do it. Right. There's there's limited. Uh, you, you see it happening in, in pockets. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, I was at TechCrunch and, and there was a startup there that was um, doing a. They had a, an automated strawberry picking, you know, machine robot. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing device. It was this thing about the size of a dump truck, um, and inside of it, it had something like 75 cameras that all you know guided these these AI arms that could lightning fast pick a strawberry bush with with precision that you just wouldn't believe. Yeah. Um, and, and so you're seeing things like that emerge. Uh, in fact, it's a good time to plug. Michigan is actually a, a positioned well to be a place of innovation for ag tech. Um, we do have an ag tech center of excellence now in Michigan. Um, the Centropolis Accelerator downstate um, has a C3 center of excellence, clean tech, uh, climate tech, and carbon tech. I don't know what the three C's are, but basically focused on um, you know, how can we apply technology, AI, uh, modern engineering, um, renewable uh, energy resource technology to mm -hmm. some of these problems in ag tech. Uh, I think it's huge because, you know, when we look at what's happening with climate change and what's happening with uh, automation and what's happening with the depletion of resources and all of that is tied together into how are we going to survive as a, as a species and here in Michigan, I think it, it's a it's a set of questions that we're really well positioned to uh, to, to to excel in. So. Right, I think it's gonna it's gonna roll out in the way of like crop sensing and imaging because we have these cameras that can read a, a high range of wavelengths mm -hmm. and based on the wavelength that's reflected from a plant, you can see the molecular concentration of it. You can see how much water is in the soil. Um, I think it's gonna start with things like that and those. That, that whole side of the industry is becoming mature, yeah. where you can fly a drone and basically give a health report to a farmer and say, this is what you're doing wrong. Your irrigation is flooding over here. There's too much uh, pesticides in a place where there's no issue. Um, it, it's kind of like helping them put the resources in the right place, which then in turns turns into a high, higher yield. Yeah, no, and in fact, that's another one where we can talk about a, a little shout out to another campfire member, the Conservation Data Lab, uh, Randy Swati from the Nat Nature Conservancy and a bunch of his uh, uh, colleagues on the CDL, the Kent Conservation Data Lab, who are NMU students uh, in ecology majors and hydrology majors and so forth, are using uh, R and, and a number of other technologies available to combine, you know, uh, LIDAR data and, and uh, ESRI data to be able to kind of look at how do we image forests and map out what's happening with forestry um, data in, in ways that we can empower the industry to make better decisions about, uh, about forestry management, for example. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that sort of thing is, I think there's a tremendous opportunity again for um, innovation to not only solve problems, but create new jobs and new opportunities for people like you, like folks that graduate from NMU and some of the members that we have down here at, at the campfire. Um, let's see, I think we've covered a lot of the ground here. And uh, is there anything that you wanted to work in about Wallington Webb or Wally Wallington or your experience of Marquette uh, that before we get to the end here? Um, off the top of my head, no. Um, so yeah, we can move on to whatever you have. Yeah. Next. All right. Well, you know what, James? I, I think this has been a really great introduction to you and to some of your knowledge. And uh, we appreciate you coming on. We appreciate you here at Campfire Coworks. Um, you can reach James through his website. Uh, it's wallingtonweb.com. You can come down to Campfire and meet him in person. He's down here a lot. Uh, and uh, also, you can meet people like James down here at our community or on our digital platform at campfirecoworks.com. Um, and places like Commonplace, Common Grounds in Traverse City with a really cool project coming up down there, 20 Fathoms, uh, 101 Quincy in, in Hancock, uh, Michigan. Shout out to them, a co-working space very much like what we're doing, the Coworks Collective in Iron Mountain. So we're trying to be a force in combining uh, and connecting with people, not only individuals, but communities where this sort of thing is happening. And 
uh, we're just really glad to have you here and uh, look forward to uh, the future that we might be able to create together. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to be a part of this place. Um, and I, I, we kind of skipped over like, why, why am I still here? You know, why do I keep coming to this co-working space, I guess? Yeah, I'd love to hear so, that. Why do you come? So, I mean, we're kind so of annoying fun. down here. So what are you, <laughs> why, why are you still here putting up with us? Yeah, they're, they're super annoying, but there, there, there's a lot of, there, there's, there, you guys have so much to offer here in terms of your understanding and your diversity and skill sets that, you know, like I came to a co-working space to kind of just get out of my house and, and work a little bit. But the people that are here and I'm surrounded by are constantly making me think in ways that, you know, empowers everything that I do. Um, and, and just in the past month, you know, my entire strategy for my business, my entire thought process of what I can achieve and what I what I shouldn't be able to achieve has, has really changed. And that's that's due to you guys, like being surrounded by these people who want to get things done, who want to change things, who want to start businesses is just, it, it's so powerful to, to be around it and, and pick up on that energy and, and have somebody to ask a question to and bounce things off of that, you know, I have no idea about, but say you, you've done it for 10 years. Mm, yeah. Um, so I, I just think there's, there's such a benefit to having a community group of people who can have different skill sets and, and, and talk and figure things out together that, you know, I'd, I'd highly recommend anybody who's just sitting at home, you know, having these, these, these same work days as a developer or an entrepreneur and you feel kind of stuck. I mean, come on down to campfire and we'll maybe not help you right away, but we'll help you think about how, how to move forward and give you different ideas and, and give you the motivation to kind of move forward. And some days that's just it. It's the motivation, the cheerleading, the holy cow, can I really pull this off and right. having the community and, and you know, that's, I'm glad you said that. I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate the fact that you're here because you are, it, it's not us giving that or creating that, it's the community creating that. Right. And the more engagement there is, the more we have that energy down here. We want to be a resource or a hub um, for all of the, the folks in our community that, that uh, are doing great things, right? So uh, thanks for saying that. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Remember next week, uh, Cal Morris Incorporated, KMI is our next guest. Uh, not next week, two weeks from now. Um, they are a, 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 a startup company here in Marquette, Michigan, and they're trying to solve the problem of space junk, keeping the world safe by cleaning up outer space because humans, wherever we go, we can't seem to avoid trashing the place. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. We went a little bit over today. James, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you around the campfire, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>